This is rural India, and a scene from a play is being performed. These actors are part of government propaganda to outlaw an event which happens every day in villages across the country. Baby girls suffer a fate once thought consigned to the past. They're killed because their parents only wanted a son. For generations, women have been treated like second-class citizens, propelled into a lifetime of subservience and hardship. At a young age, girls like Pasupathi have to work in dingy conditions. Child labor is still legal in India. For every 1,000 boxes, she earns just 25 cents. I don't miss school very much. Everyone here has to work. We need the money. After work, Pasupathi helps her mother in the fields. Like most girls, she has little chance of an education. Her father's a farmer, and it was clear which of his children should go to school. My son goes to school. My daughter has to work. I can't send them all to school. It's free, but I don't have the money for school books and pencils. Most of the country's 150 million working children are girls. Widespread poverty means families need to send their children to work. The state has tried to reverse this trend, but without funds they have little chance of success, although some schools are up and running. <laughs> We run schools, particularly for children who are in bonded labor. They should have a chance. For every child that comes to school, you give them a kilo of grain a day, worth five rupees. It's only a small amount, but for Santosh Kumani, it's something to take home to her parents. She's one of the lucky girls who go to school, but three hours before it starts, she helps her mother and sisters clean bulb fittings. It's a daily chore, and for a 25 kilo sack of plugs, they earn a pittance. Santosh resents the burden on her and her schoolwork. I'm always so tired, in school too. I'm always working, and I don't have time for anything else, even homework. I've got no free time to play. And it's the same story across India. This is a factory in the north, and the work face is made up of women and girls. They make glass bangles which adorn the wrists of Indian women. In the nearby city of Firozabad, around 50,000 children are making these at home. They'd be worse off without the money, but they still feel fate has cheated them. Work never stops for us. We cook, clean the house, wash and make bangles. The men come home from work and are served. In my next life, I want to be born as a boy. Swami Agnavesh is a priest and a politician. He feels uneasy about the state of women's rights and campaigns against injustice. Many of his followers consider him a saint. Successive governments have acted very carelessly. They've abused their constitutional mandate and responsibilities. As a result, we have 135 million children that don't go to school. 65 million child bonded laborers. It's a very depressing situation. As long as these children don't get a good quality relevant full-time education, at least until they're 14 years old, with skills training, there's no hope of any breakthrough 
in the vicious cycle of poverty, unemployment, child labor, and population growth. Unemployment, child labor, population growth, etc. The last Indian census in 1991 recorded a population of over 900 million people. Sometime around the millennium, the population will exceed one billion. Many will survive by begging, scavenging through rubbish for food or wood to burn. Most girls will pass on the cycle of illiteracy for future generations. At the beginning of the next century, every second illiterate person in the world will be Indian, yet the government will spend millions on developing nuclear arms. But there are some in high office who are trying to change things. As a Brahmin, Kamal Kishore belongs to the highest caste in India. The caste system divides Indian society into rich and poor, with no chance of escape. Kamal rejects the caste system as exploitation and subservience. The Brahmins only care about themselves. One is born into a caste and can't do anything about it. In Hindu mythology, poverty and exploitation result from actions in an earlier life. The Brahmins call it the will of God. The UN's children's agency, UNICEF, has been active in India for 50 years. Its director, Carol Bellamy, is touring villages to check on local projects funded by the organization. She also recognizes there are major issues in India concerning women's rights but strongly identifies education as the key to change. We think one of the best uh, uh, kinds of things that can help the community generally is if girls are able to get an education, because if they get an education, just a primary school education, they're more likely to take care of themselves, they're more likely to have healthy children, they're, they're, they understand the importance of nutrition, both for the boy and the girl, so that it has implications for the fact that women are treated as lesser human beings. But if it's not poverty or the caste system hindering girls, then child marriages offer another obstacle. It's still customary in India for families to marry off their daughters at a young age. In most parts, it's an economic necessity relieving the household of another mouth to feed. In some cases, the unfortunate girls can be married off whilst they are still toddlers. <coughs> we married off many of our daughters when they were three years old. That's the custom. I didn't know it was forbidden. Now my daughter is staying with us until she's older. I would like to choose my own husband, but that's not possible. I can't go to school. Everything is decided for me. I am promised. <laughs> Even though a father will have to supply a dowry or a sum of money with his daughter's marriage, it means in the long term his family is less likely to suffer financial hardship. I had three daughters, and my brother had two. It was a bargain if we could marry them all together. It cost us less. Then people said we had to keep our daughters and send them to school. But customs will remain as long as there's illiteracy and poverty. Almost half of India's population lives below the poverty line, and the ranks of the poor are swelling at a rate of 10 million a year. Girls can expect to inherit jobs with a low income and no job security. Often they'll work the longest hours in the worst conditions, while the opportunities for self-employment are almost non-existent. I work from dawn to sunset. We earn about one and a half dollars a day. At least we earn something. Otherwise, there's almost no work for us. We have a saying, the sand is our mother.